It's Build a Big Podcast, the marketing podcast for podcasters. I'm David Hooper. Have you ever been on a date with somebody you've met through an old school online dating service? When I say old school, I'm talking Match.com, OkCupid, Plenty of Fish, Hotmail. (laughs) Hotmail used to have a dating service. AOL used to have a dating service. I knew a girl, this is 20 years ago. (laughs) She was dating these guys. How'd you meet him? Kind of country girl. Hotmail. (laughs) And I had this other guy I worked with. This is when I was doing my music conference. We would travel around the country promoting this conference. We were doing events all over the place. And every single city, this dude had a date. I was like, what are you doing, man? AOL. That was his thing. So this is what I'm talking about. Those old school services. Maybe Tinder does this. Grindr, that's your thing. Never used either one of those. If they have you fill out information, if it's not just a picture, there's like a profile, this will apply to those too. It's a pretty common scenario to find somebody who seems great on paper, but doesn't really match what they have said about themselves when you meet them in person. For an example, an older photo, maybe even a fake photo, or the guy who said he never smokes, but he actually smokes on the weekend or smokes when he drinks, or the woman who says she drinks socially, but she's a full-blown alcoholic, the guy who says he's divorced, but he's actually still married. Why is that? It's not because people lie. Not always. Sometimes it is. It's more often because people fill out surveys and they describe themselves as the people they want to be, not who they are. It's like people who buy clothes that don't fit them. They're too small for them because they're planning on losing weight. It's the equivalent of that. There are also certain industries, maybe even all industries, where we do what's expected of us. We act in a certain way. An example of that would be you follow a minister, a pastor, a preacher, whatever you want to call him on Facebook. You know he's not having a great marriage, but on Facebook, he's acting as if he is. And this certainly happens when we're interviewing people or even talking to people. If you've ever been in a strip club and you talk to a stripper, she's going to tell you that she's dancing to work her way through school. (laughs) she's not going to talk to you about bad decisions or having a kid and really needing the money. She's going to talk about, I'm doing this to work my way through school. That's a stripper story and sort of stripper related. There's a great podcast documentary right now. It's about Tracy Lords. She's had a music career, film career, but what really put her on the map was her start in the adult film industry. This podcast is called once upon a time in the Valley, the Valley. If you don't know, where most of the adult films in the United States are shot, or they used to be back when it was a real industry and not something that everybody was doing with video cameras and Snapchats and whatever else we're doing these days. Anyway, Tracy, she was an adult actress and there's a lot of controversy around her. So the hosts are interviewing a lot of people within that industry about what really happened with Tracy Lords. The controversy around her, if you're not familiar with it, was that Tracy got into this business At 15 years old, she used fake IDs to do it. She says she was a victim. A lot of people think that she was a victim. A lot of people think that she was conniving and she planned it out and she manipulated everybody within the industry. So that's the discussion here. All her movies from when she was underage, they were pulled. A lot of people almost went to jail over it. Several more people did go to jail over it. So you can see the sensitivity around the topic. Plus, It's a business where you're not getting the full story. It's fantasy. Like a lot of entertainment businesses, you don't get the full story. The rock star is always rocking and partying. You don't see the hard work. On the other side of that, maybe you'll have somebody in the Christian business, lives a perfect life, never makes a mistake. Think about these guys like Jerry Falwell Jr. Perfect life, never made a mistake. Everything is great until it wasn't. And I think that's the truth with all of us. We have the lives that we put out onto the world through podcast interviewing, through our podcast even, through social media and Facebook, certainly. As a podcaster, this is a problem that you are also facing when doing interviews, no matter who you're talking to. People give canned responses. As I mentioned, we've all got that forward-facing social media 
public front that we put out there. But as people who get interviewed a lot, we also get comfortable with these stories. It's like a comedian giving a set that he knows is going to work every time. That's what we do with those stories. So we ease into that, kick back, put our feet up, deliver that every single time as part of our energy management, how we get through so many interviews that we do. How do you break around this? Like an attorney with a witness on the stand, you can spend a lot of time interviewing people and wait for them to let their guards down. People come to you with prepared material. It's stories they've told a million times. Grooved, honed, canned stories that reflect how they see themselves or how they wish to be seen. And this isn't the material you want. This is the barrier to the material you want. So what you try to do is keep the interview going until the person gets tired or bored or swept up in a memory or a story and lets the barrier drop. Starts talking in fresh, spontaneous ways. I'm going to play an example of how this works. This is the before. This is the answer they got from this guy they were interviewing the first time. When we interviewed PT, we asked him early on what he felt his obligations were to the young women who were considering becoming performers. After all, he'd been a star adult performer and had become a star adult director. Here's his answer. We went out of our way to make sure that girls were healthy, that they stayed healthy, and more than that, that the girls knew what they were doing. I had a, a thousand conversations with girls. Do you know what you're doing? Do you realize that you're never going to run for mayor of your town? Please consider this effect of this on your life. What this guest is doing there, I see this all the time working with people in the entertainment industry. They give you a common story about their success, how great everything is. Then when you hang out a bit, you start to see holes in the story. And something like this happens. In the second or third hour of the interview, our conversation circled back. We again asked PT what he felt his obligations were to the young women who were considering becoming performers. PT's answer this time. I wouldn't diagnose their personalities as far as she'll be fine and she won't. I just try to let them know what they're up against, what's going to happen, and then made them responsible for themselves. And without a doubt, I saw girls and men we had no business being in such a crazy environment. No business at all. They weren't going to be able to handle it. It was going to ruin their psyches. Um, but we would always err on the side. Paul pauses here and stretches out the pause. And we wait for him to close on the inevitable of caution. To tell us that the industry was ultra-conscientious about warning unsuitable people away. Because that's more or less the party line, what we'd been hearing from adult industry people since we started interviewing them for this project. And obviously Paul knows that we're expecting of caution, because he flashes a devilish grin before saying, Of whatever suited us best. <laughs> we wouldn't err on the side of caution. That's for damn sure. Let's talk about how to make this happen. Let's talk about how to have these real moments when you're doing your interviews. You can approach the question from a different angle. You can let the topic come up again. That sounds like that's what happened here. And the reason that works is because the more time you spend with people, the more likely they are to feel comfortable and let you in. But how can you shortcut this? That's the real question. We don't always have time on our podcast to spend three or four hours with people. We're not going that deep. We don't always have three to four hours to spend with people like they did on this podcast, Once Upon a Time in the Valley. We're not doing a docu-series. We're doing one interview. It's relatively quick. How can we speed this up? I wrote extensively about this in my book, Big Podcast. If you don't already have that book, Amazon has it. You can go to bigpodcast.com slash audiobook. If you want to pick up the audiobook version of that for free via Audible. But let me give you a couple of things that you can do right now. If you want to shortcut rapport, one of the best things you can do is a pre-interview. A lot of times people think a pre-interview is just getting information from a guest, finding out what you're going to ask, finding out little stories that might not pop up, being able to prep everything ahead of time so you can get a better interview. But a pre-interview, that's not just for finding out info. It's also for building rapport. The more times you have contact with somebody, and if you can have those contacts in different ways, the more rapport you're going to have with somebody. For example, let's say you and I don't know each other. 
and we meet each other at a podcasting event. It's a little awkward. Maybe you've heard the podcast. Maybe I've heard of you. We talk a little bit. Hey, man, great to meet you. But let's say it's an annual event. What's going to happen the next year when we see each other? We're like old friends. We already know stuff about each other. We were there together last year. We're there this year. We don't have that new person awkwardness. And we've got stuff to connect on. Hey, man, how have you been since the last time I saw you? What do you think of this year compared to last year? What have you been doing since last year? What's up with that thing we talked about? How is that going for you? That's one of the big advantages of having a pre-interview. It is another connection that you can have with the person that you're interviewing. So when you go into that full-on interview, they already know you. You don't have to get that weird, awkward stuff out of the way. You get straight to the meat. But even if you don't get to have a pre-interview, this is the number two thing that you can do. Go ahead and kick the interview off acting like the rapport is already there. Act like you know the guy and show him that you are on his side. I mentioned wearing people down like an attorney, keeping them on the stand, asking those questions around and around and around again till you get the answers that you want. The other element of that is if the attorney is on your side, he's going to ask you questions that he knows the answers to. He's going to ask you questions that make you look good. And I've even used this analogy to people that I meet. My job is like an attorney. When you come into my studio, my job is to make you sound your best. My job is to make you look good. I want to get a good interview from you. I want to get stories, but I'm not here trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to help you get your story out. So you can let people know that. I'm trying to help you get your story out. We are working together. And you've got to say this. People don't know this. They don't take it for granted. They're worried about a couple things when they come in for an interview. For one, they're often nervous because they don't know what's going on. You do interviews all the time. Your guest, chances are he doesn't. Even if he's done a few of them, he hasn't done an interview with you. So you got to let him know, here's what's going to happen. That's going to get him to relax. That's going to get him to be able to focus on getting that story out. But the other thing is, because people are used to going into this adversarial relationship with somebody from the media, a guest is worried about looking stupid. Think about the adult industry. You can imagine those guys. Well, what about this? You're exploiting women. You're taking advantage of people. You had an underage girl that you were shooting. That's probably what they think when they hear the name Tracy Lords. These guys had to say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're trying to get the whole story out. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We're not trying to condemn you. We're not trying to make you look bad. But you've got to work into that. And the way you work into that is acting as if that rapport is already there. Acting as if you trust that person. Acting as if you know that person. When you act that way, you're going to get that response from him. So let people know what your process is. And let them know that you want them to sound great. That's the goal of the podcast. Now, I'm not saying to do propaganda, not like that, not a puff piece, but you're trying to get an honest story out. You're trying to hear their side of the situation. You present their side, you present other sides, which is what the Once Upon a Time in the Valley podcast does. Let listeners make their own decision. So try those two things in your next interview. Do a pre-interview, get to know the person ahead of time. And also, when you get the person on the line for that interview or get next to them, if you're doing an interview in person, act like you know them. Act like you've known each other forever and start asking those questions. You're going to be amazed at the response that you get. I've got a lot more thoughts on this in the book. Bigpodcast.com slash book has all the book options, including the free audiobook offer. That's at bigpodcast.com slash book. And if you want more from me on Build a Big Podcast, that is available on bigpodcast.com as well. Go to bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. You'll see the subscription options for you. Like the book, there are multiple options. There's one for iPhone, one for Android, one for an RSS feed. So however you get your podcast, one click, I can get it to you each and every time free of charge. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Thank you for listening to Build a Big Podcast. Go to bigpodcast.com slash subscribe, and I will see you on the next episode.